Welcome everyone to the resilience webinar titled US Army Corps of Engineers Wildfire Flood Risk Management R&D. I'm Tamel Harbison with the SAME National Office and I will be here in the background to assist with any technical issues you might experience throughout the presentation. Before we get started, I would like to go over a couple housekeeping rules. Um, you came in on a listen only mode, but if you could double check to make sure that your microphones are muted. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, we ask that you ask those in the Q&A tab. You can also find the PDH certificate and the PDF version of this presentation in the handout section. This webinar will be recorded and will be able to and will be able to view on the COY webpage. And now I would like to turn it over to Mike Pampalone, our moderator for today. Hey folks, how you doing? I, uh, I threw my camera on here for a minute while I talked to you. So, so I just wanna say, I found out uh, the other day that um, this is SAME's first time using this platform. Uh, so we're all guinea pigs here. So I, I will promise we've gone through it a couple of times. So I feel pretty comfortable with with how this is all going to work. Uh, but bear with us if we have uh, technical issues today. We'll we'll get back on track. Um, so really quickly, um, like um, uh, Tamel uh, mentioned, I'm Mike Pampalone. Um, just by way of a quick introduction, I lead um, the Homeland Security National Resilience uh, business for ICF uh, International, and I am uh, a member of the SAME Resilience uh, Community of Interest. So the COI today has a uh, what I think is a really exciting uh, presentation uh, for you here today to talk about uh, flood risk and, and specifically flood risk as it pertains to uh, wildfires. We, we heard a lot about um, you know, the wildfires last year over the summer, really, really an incredible, uh, incredibly devastating wildfire season. And it got us thinking, you know, what is uh, our community doing to um, to help kind of mitigate some of the risk associated with wildfires? Uh, um, and it kind of led us to uh, to this uh, this presentation today. Where we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is doing and, and perhaps some ideas um that um you know for you all uh, to get involved in um in a kind of, kind of post wildfire um flood risk uh and and landslide uh, risk mitigation so before we get started and before i introduce our speaker um we're gonna do something um uh a little bit different with the platform today this is where we this is where we get into technical things but i think this is going to work um so we're, we have some poll questions for you so tamel is going to put some poll questions up on the board and what i'd like for you all to do is answer the poll questions um for us it gives us a little bit of idea of who you all are um and then um after we answer the poll questions we'll we'll get right into it and i think if you just answer them and submit uh, it should bring you right back here. And Tamel, I okay, only saw now. one poll question. Uh, should we have three? Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and close this first one, and then launch the second one. Kind of go uh, launch them one at a time here. Okay, perfect. Bear with us. We should have. We should have three poll questions for you all today. That second question now, is for all the cool. physicists in the room. I'm going to go ahead and launch the third poll question. And the high, uh, that's the Army Corps of Engineers uh, Hydraulic Engineering Center um, who puts out that numerical software. Okay, um, I'm going to ha go ahead and close the poll and then uh, turn it back over to you, Mike. Excellent. All right, folks, thanks a lot for, for bearing with us. And, and um, that gives us a little bit of a sense of, of who's who's attending today. So um, uh, next, let me just introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker today is, in, maybe go to the next slide. Our speaker today is uh, Ian Floyd. So Ian's a principal investigator with the U.S. Army um, Engineer Research and Development Center. Uh, Coastal Hydraulics Laboratory located at the Waterways Experiment Station. He's in uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi. So his uh, research areas, and this is really interesting for us, um, and really, really great research that he's doing um, in computational fluid dynamics, sediment transport mechanics, 
uh, non-Newtonian numerical modeling and uh, geomorphology. Um, so he serves as technical lead for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers post wildfire flood risk management research and development program. Um, and then before joining the ERDC, he uh, received his bachelor's degree in geology from the University of Southern Mississippi uh, and is currently working on and is, um, is scheduled to receive his Ph.D. in engineering science in uh, in May of this year uh, from Louisiana. Louisiana State University College of Engineering. So prior to joining ERDC, uh, uh, Ian served uh, 10 years uh, in, the, um, in the U.S. Army and then in the U.S. Uh, um, Air Force and the Air National Guard, um, serving in uh, two deployments uh, to Iraq and uh, OIF and also to Germany. So Ian, thanks so much for, for being with us today and uh, thank you for your service. Uh, we really appreciate it, and um, thank you. I am going to uh, kick it over to you uh, for the presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, is um, is everyone able to hear me and coming through? Just check, sound check. Yeah, I, I have you loud and clear. Perfect. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay. So today I want to uh, spend a little time talking about uh, some things related to, to wildfires, uh, specifically in, in uh, western regions of the U.S. and also quite a few regions around the world, um, not only places like Australia, but uh, also places in the Mediterranean, um, in Europe. Uh, also, you know, uh, some issues with, with uh, you know, really brush fires related to places like uh, China and the like. Um, and in these environments, and today, specifically in these environments we're going to talk about today, is some of the, the subsequent flood risks and, and issues and the challenges associated with predicting and, and understanding these. Um, so our research team is located out of Erdick in Vicksburg. It used to be Waterways Experiment Station. It is the uh, U.S. Army Engineer Research Development Center. I'm in the Coastal and Hydraulics Lab. I'm actually part of the River, en and engineering and or river Estuary and en or Engineering Branch. Um, excuse me, we just merged with our estuarine engineering branch. Um, and I've been there uh, uh, going about 11 years now. So kind of the first things we'll talk a little bit about is, is, is how we address these things. And so, uh, you know, when we first start looking at, you know, this, this problem really uh, became an issue uh, for, it uh, came on our radar in about 2014, 15, uh, a few years following the Los Conches wildfire for Albuquerque district. Um, so within USACE, uh, how it operates uh, for right now during civil works, uh, there are statements of need that are submitted from the district. Um, those, uh, those statements of need uh, are, are coordinated with folks at IWR, HEC, um, or at uh, RMC, or at ERIC. Um, and uh, typically those ideas uh, then are supported by research funding from the civil works community. So when we started on this, we were uh, working with SPD or SPK. Um, so uh, excuse me, with Albuquerque District SPA. That has since expanded to every district within SPD and NWD. Uh, the way our teams are set up is we have a primary project development team led out of uh, ERDIC and IWR. Um, then we have USACE partners that are composed of regional technical specialists or SMEs in a variety of areas from sediment to hydrology, to hydraulics and modeling. Um, this also includes you know, discussions with leadership and at their level. So one of the big things we do on this is, you know, we have explicitly embedded our partners at the district um, to help tackle this. We also have several external partners. This list has grown quite a bit since, since uh, um, it needs to be updated. Um, those, uh, really some of those uh, partners include both you know, uh, research institutes like DRI, uh, but also USGS, Forest Service, BLM. Uh, we've also had some interaction with uh, Cal Fire, Caltrans, um, and we also have universities we work with. We also have a couple of dedicated partners in Santa Barbara, uh, Ventura County, and, um, and Saratoga Springs in Utah. Uh, and so a lot of times these, you know, these are um, derived from, you know, we have a fire, either there is a flood or we, you know, perceive a risk uh, following the fire, uh, that would produce a flood, uh, and we would step in and, and do uh, assessments and then uh, assist with numerical modeling. So the team that we've, uh, you know, assembled for this, uh, and which is growing, um, it, you know, really is composed of a diverse background, which is very important for these projects, and really driven by our district's needs. 
So post-wildfire research and development. So what are we getting at here? So in, in USACE, when we first started looking at this problem, uh, there were places like LA that had been dealing with this for uh, quite a number of years compared to um, other areas. And um, they actually have quite a robust database that, that was very helpful. Um, unfortunately, uh, those, um, you know, kind of those uh, antiquated methodologies um, are really difficult to extrapolate out to places like Albuquerque or Seattle. Um, or, or Walla Walla District. Um, and so, you know, we had to look at what is our mission in the Army Corps and how it relates to, to post fires and increased flood risk. Well, obviously it's flood risk management. Uh, the other that we're realizing is emergency management. And so what we're really trying to do with this is, is predict our qualitative understanding, but then also solidifying a quantitative understanding um, to look at how we predict these, um, you know, uh, post-fire runoff and, and subsequent uh, downstream flood events. The images we're looking at here are from Santa Barbara, uh, the, the, the 2017 Thomas fire, uh, the photo on the left there. The photo on the right is uh, the aftermath of a uh, massive debris flow, a uh, series of debris flows that, uh, that, um, that took out Highway 101 and did um, uh, extensive destruction and, and unfortunately a loss of lives. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about you know, the lessons we've learned from that and, and, and really demonstrate why some of these modeling improvements we're doing are, are necessary. So some trends. So, so things that are, that are very concerning to us uh, are not only um, the, the number of fires that we're seeing, but the total acreage is burned. Um, this is just, uh, you know, kind of a subset, an example of trends that we're seeing um, specifically across the Southwest, so Nevada, California, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico. Um, the, the gradients on these plots, uh, if you kind of imaginary put a trend line through these, a linear fit, um, it's, it's concerning uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and so it really going into this, uh, this trend has been going on for quite a number of years. And so, you know, thinking, okay, how do we pragmatically uh, address this? Uh, and, and as I alluded to, that begins with a better understanding and then prediction. Uh, the better we get at predicting, the better we can, can manage. So one of the first things we'll talk about here, and some of this will be a little bit more um, you know, educational. It, it appeared from the, the polls that uh, you know, most people uh, you know, haven't had to experience uh, post-fire flood risk. Uh, and then there are varying levels, I think, of understanding, which is perfectly fine. Um, and so, you know, when we think about research at ERDIC and HEC, uh, you know, we have to balance the practicality of the need. So if you need to have a model that turns around within days versus models that can be higher fidelity that are used for floodplain management study, engineering, construction, and design, uh, those type of situations, but where we start are, are the physical mechanisms that drive the, the process or the phenomena we're, we're trying to understand. Uh, and so when we first started in this, it was really a, a challenge of bringing everything together. A uh, paper in uh, 2013 that was put together by uh, some folks at the USGS, um, uh, John Moody specifically as the lead author, really broke things down and started to develop the basic you know, structure of, of where we are and then where you know, the future direction is going to go with, with our needs of research. Um, we have these four kind of modes of physical mechanisms. So rainfall, infiltration, runoff, and erosion. I think for most hydrologic problems, uh, this can be a standard schema to, to look into. Now, obviously, some of the, the details change, um, but as you can see, they're, they're really important elements of all of this. Our primary focuses were on erosion, runoff, and infiltration. And taking up the challenge of how we take this science that is, uh, although quantitative, um, it's still more qualitative in the sense of computational fluid dynamics. And how do we meld those together so that we have not only robust models, but things that are um, practical to use? So you have a wildfire. Um, several things happen, and it really depends on the duration and the intensity. So if you think about a hydrograph of heat, of temperature with time, the longer that it stays at a higher temperature, uh, really the, the more the more effect you're gonna to likely to see. Um, there's a very strong correlation between higher burn severity and full crown burn and these types of um, um, effects that we see here in the, the photo. The other thing you notice is ground cover is gone. Um, there are no shrubs, there are no grasses. So uh, a few key things actually happening following the fires, 
Uh, there are effects of the soil um, and sediment that we'll talk about a little bit. And all of this leads to dramatically altering your hydrologic processes, um, specifically run out uh, or excuse me, run off. Um, you also have uh, very high sediment loads that are uh, that are very common and typical in these in these post fire events, uh, which leads to a very set of uh, another set of very pro complicated uh, problems associated with how we predict the physics that we'll talk a little bit more about uh, shortly. Uh, so in, in essence, you lose your inception canopy, you lose your ground surface. So you, you end up having particles that uh, would have otherwise not hit the ground, that hit the ground, detach. Because you have a smoother surface, you have uh, really an increased connectivity. So you reduce your run time um, as far as, uh, you, you know, there's nothing to slow it down, which means you're going to have uh, obviously higher energy events um, that are going to lead to a lot of downstream reworking and, and uh, mobility of sediments. The other big effects and things that we look at, too, are, are on sediments and soil. So we account for vegetation changes, but we also have to account for soil changes. And I think people may have heard of terms like hydrophobic soils. Um, we really consider that a tertiary effect, although it is important. Um, there are bigger effects that we look into. Um, and a lot of those effects are the depth. So, you know, we're really curious about as, as a given temperature for a period of time, you know, how how deep are those effects? You know, the other big issue is, is ash generation. Um, and, and these hydrophobic layers combined with the loss of your surface roughness really lead to uh, increase, you know, even more uh, increases in, in runoff. The other really interesting thing that I think people need to be at least cognizant of when they're thinking about post-fire flooding is ash. Um, so when we uh, look at physical systems that, um, that have, you know, in, in reality, two phases. So the water and the sediment uh, you know, the water isn't completely dominant. We can't just ignore the, you know, the, 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 um, the effects of, of that sediment at super high concentrations. And so what we see with ash is ash actually tends to, to onset this non-Newtonian behavior that we talked about earlier, and we're going to talk more. Um, and so, you know, it's also, you know, I think an awareness that uh, things are just a little bit different, and we're really not quite sure, um, you know, the exact physical mechanisms as to why that happens. Uh, if people are interested, I have obviously hypothesis. Um, and then the other big challenge in, in, uh, that we really look at is, you know, how sporadic these effects are. Um, usually like hydrophobic uh, effects are localized to certain types of vegetation. And so, um, you know, that's a problem. And then also uh, the issue of, um, you know, how variable the burn severity is. So usually low burn severity uh, situations we typically ignore. Um, and really when you get into moderate and uh, severe is when you start to have a lot of concern. Okay, so we've talked about a few of the, you know, uh, background things that happen following a fire. So we remove the vegetation, uh, we remove ground cover, uh, we alter the soils, we produce ash, uh, and all of this leads to altering hydrology. Well, the end member, what is that? Um, so the first is, is that it, 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 it really is a very complicated problem because not only does it vary in space, uh, it also varies in time. And so uh, if you think about a hurricane, there are usually predefined paths that hurricanes take, you know, say in the Gulf of Mexico. There is some variability in that. Um, but, you know, the physics of identifying these problems and rapidly assessing them uh, is really compounded by that, the variability across the space and time and the uncertainty in a given response as well. And so, um, you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, obviously significant the hazard to life and infrastructure. Um, as we pointed out, we're seeing, uh, other than a few very localized physiographic regions, um, uh, really associated with locations in, in uh, Idaho and Walla Walla this past year, other than that, uh, we're seeing a significant increase in, in the intensity and duration. Uh, one thing that we, we have documented uh, by others and our work as well uh, is that peak discharge, so your discharge following a wildfire um, uh, increase uh, by uh, around an order of magnitude. Uh, in some cases, uh, we like to really put it around four to eight times, but there is documented evidence of, you know, a thousand time increase being very common. And so what that means is, is that a, you know, 10 year or 25 year rainfall event may actually produce a 500 year uh, flood event. Uh, that flood event is likely going to be non-Newtonian in nature at some portion along the continuum of its flow path. Uh, but the other challenge is, is that it may not. Um, so the uh, one challenge we had to look at is, 
um, you know, being able to model this in a framework that can do both sets of physics. Uh, and again, we'll get a little more into the non-Newtonian physics in just a moment. Um, the other thing that we have trouble with, as I alluded to, is for a given rainfall event, what is the magnitude of volume released? Um, a lot of that is, is very challenging because gauging is, very, is destroyed. Um, and then a lot of expansive co uh, data collection is, is, um, is very costly. Uh, the other is, is that, uh, you know, say if you have a watershed that's burned and it has several outlets, uh, you only have enough money to put a gauge on, say, one. Well, events may not actually occur on that. So I think you can see the, the challenges. And so, uh, you know, having a better assessment and an idea of, of a giving rainfall event, uh, you know, and what that response is going to be is critical. Um, the you know, other things that we are obviously concerned about are, are recovery and climate change uncertainty. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the prevalence of droughts followed by, you know, very dramatic and intense storms, uh, AR events. Uh, we also are concerned with like rain on snow, the flood events that are on fires. Um, and this really affects really most of our business lines across Tuesdays. Is there a, play, a way to play the video? Um, no, there is not. Uh, t -t 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 -t. Oh, no big deal. Sorry about that. Uh, no, no, uh, if everyone will bear with me, if it's okay, um, uh, I can share my screen and I've got the PowerPoint here with the video. Okay. All right, sorry about this, everyone. Uh, should have got this squared away beforehand. Uh, so, the, because uh, it's pretty important. So this was taken uh, for the, really the first event following uh, the Lost Camp Contest fire, just up to Coach D Reservoir, which is a USA operated reservoir. This was probably about a loud. Wow. Um, so, uh, this. Um, this event was probably about a three year uh, to a five year rainfall event. Um, and I think, you know, some of the things that we're looking at here that are very different are obviously the sediment concentration. Um, the other thing that's that's uh, very obvious is the forcings that we're seeing. Uh, and there are reasons for that that are, that are physically based. Um, and so one thing we're seeing here is, is also a stationary point of view as the hydrograph moves through. And so if you remember the front, we had a little bit subtle, uh, you know, differences. Uh, mainly associated with vegetation and slightly higher concentrations of sediment. What we're seeing now is, is kind of the, the mid, um, you, know, uh, you know, I would call this the debris flood or ash flood following the fire. Uh, and so, you know, as you can see, uh, there's a, apparently a variability in the properties of this, of this flow. It also looks different. Um, this flow has more turbulence. Uh, you, you see a lot of supercritical things. Uh, and so, you know, what that told me early on in this is that we need to be able to account for that variability. Uh, and what we do is we associate that with, say, concentration of sediment. Uh, the other thing that we had to be able to do is, uh, you know, understand, is it non-Newtonian or is it Newtonian? Uh, that was uh, a bit challenging. Uh, but what we've done is we've uh, and, and, uh, really put in uh, um, checks and balances within the code. Uh, we are still testing some of this, but in our alpha and beta versions, um, there, there are some of this capability. Um, but where we're going to go in the future is, you know, as the flood event is generated in the upper watershed, um, and let's see. Uh, so as this flood event is generated, you know, um, as it evolves over time, the physics change. Um, and in some cases, we may say, well, you know, the physics may not dictate that, you know, the necessity of this level of, of you, know, uh, um, you know, fidelity and, and using this level of physics. Uh, but what we're, we're, I'm going to demonstrate is that it has a significant difference. Um, and so how we've really partitioned this is in this conceptual model is, uh, you know, two approaches. So if you're looking at a screening level assessment to where you have a very short period of time, you would uh, be able to take uh, in our new uh, software releases and the new updates. 
the HEC HMS model and do quite a few things to estimate uh, not only uh, the generation of sediment from each of the basins, um, but then, you know, uh, with NHMS, you know, a very crude understanding uh, of how, uh, it, you know, what's the downstream runout, what's the downstream extent. Uh, we also have a gridded, uh, 2D gridded surface, subsurface hydrologic analysis model, GEISHA. Um, this is, uh, again, a USACE model, just like HEC, uh, HMS. Uh, and so, uh, you know, these uh, can either be used by themselves or, or, uh, or coupled with our uh, hydraulic models like 1 or 2D hectares. Uh, and so uh, our research is looking at not only, um, you know, what our models are capable of doing, but what in existing models can be incorporated within like HMS, let's say, so that uh, uh, some decisions can be made with a little bit more confidence. And so what am I getting at here? Uh, so a lot of the approaches that we use to uh, predict uh, runoff um, and generation of that are uh, empirical um, uh, models. So they were direct, derived from, you know, parameterization of field data. Um, they are, uh, there are quite a few, a number of those. Um, some that were developed from uh, a lot of the uh, data in Southern California, uh, USGS. Uh, and so these approaches are used to estimate uh, you know, what is the volume potential generated from a subbasin that then connects down to the channel to be routed? And so this is an example of the variability that we see uh, just across these five models. Um, and so uh, we have added quite a few more of these options in here now um, and, you know, we're still making improvements and testing. But, uh, you know, the ability to look at a variety of these approaches to make a better decision, um, you know, keeping in mind that, uh, you know, not all of these empirical models were developed with the same, you know, physiographic or the same geomorphology and geology. Uh, and so, you know, extrapolating something that was developed for, uh, you know, say Portland is probably not as applicable to something that, you know, was developed for Southern Colorado or New Mexico. But if we get all of these models together, I think it gives you a better idea of what we're looking at. Um, this is also being done um, for uh, a number of other locations around the U.S., uh, and we're doing a very similar process with our uh, Geisha model. Uh, now, I'll have to say, uh, within the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, especially with the ERDIC and out of URHEC, we pride ourselves in, um, you know, our level of, um, you know, validation and verification. So verification, you know, well, I guess verification and validation. So verification is really um, do the physics and the way we've typed it into the, the you know, Fortran or C code, does it produce the solutions it should? Uh, validation is uh, actual comparison of that to some set of physical data. Uh, we've done a number of flume experiments, but the, the really the, the gold standard for these flume experiments will, are, is part of uh, USGS Research Outfit in uh, Oregon. Uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Iverson, who's now retired, uh, really got all this together and uh, really has some of the most uh, robust non-Newtonian models in the world. Uh, we're going to watch this and talk just a moment about um, some of the, the things we're seeing. So non-Newtonian uh, fluids are fluids that are complex or nonlinear. Uh, these fluids uh, tend to behave more like honey uh, or, or, or crude oil than water. Uh, and, and if you think about, uh, you know, a simple uh, diagram that has stress on one axis and on the bottom axis, you would have maybe... Uh, let's say, a deformation. So uh, when you deform water, there's going to be a linear relationship between applying that stress and then that deformation occurring. Uh, fundamentally, a non-Newtonian fluid actually either um, uh, has a uh, you know, non-linear uh, uh, function that describes that, uh, or there's an offset that we do um, and approximate it with what we would say a uh, yield strength. Uh, so all that really leads to completely different behavior than what we see with, with clear water flooding. Uh, one thing I'll point out here is, um, you know, our ADH, uh, which is our CHL version of uh, 2D um, uh, hydro and sediment model, and our RAS uh, 2D models, uh, we're able to replicate this um, actually better than uh, uh, the author's first uh, uh, ver version of his model. Um, RAS uh, actually uh, was a little bit uh, uh, not quite as, as robust, uh, or as, as not robust, not quite as accurate uh, as ADH, but still, uh, you know, uh, very, you know, very defensible 
We have made improvements and RAS actually looks a lot more like ADH now. Um, and that's keeping in mind that this slope is about 30, uh, 30 degrees. Um, so we've had to put in some slope correction factors to account for those things. So uh, very promising results that, that we'll show how that translates into reality. So the 2017 Thomas fire uh, was devastating. Um, the fire itself destroyed uh, hundreds of, of uh, homes. Uh, but the following flooding event that occurred that January, right after really the, the so really the fire wasn't even contained yet uh, when this atmospheric river, about a 500 year precip event, um, dropped a tremendous amount of rain right on top of this freshly burned star. Uh, that type of challenge to where there's no time between, you know, you, you can't get boots on the ground. You can do some uh, assessment with GIS information. Uh, but in their case, you know, uh, they just had very little to no time to, to really, you know, the fire is still going on. This AR comes in. Uh, they have very little warning and it was it was very destructive. Uh, our estimates from the county are about one point three billion with in damage. Uh, and unfortunately, 23 people lost their lives. Uh, so Santa Barbara reached out to us about, uh, you know, how do we model this? And so we presented to them to work with the Los Angeles district um, to use our new non-Newtonian library capability within RAS um, and also our new hydrology model, um, you know, our better understanding of how we, we utilize our models. Um, but the big thing that we wanted to look at is, you know, how would this compare to the actual uh, footprint and the the, what data that was collected from this. So some interesting things to point out here, uh, and we'll go through this, this video, um, we won't watch the whole thing, uh, are, are the avulsions. So avulsions are basically when a channel is blocked and it has to change path. Uh, and so unfortunately, these avulsions led to um, destruction of quite a number of properties. We're gonna zoom in here um, real quick and then we're gonna keep our time. So zooming into this, this avulsion here, this is at Montecito Creek. Um, what happened is the, and, and this is in no way uh, any, you know, uh, the, the infrastructure actually did very admirable con considering that, you know, um, it, when it, what the basis for which it was designed, but uh, several of these larger bridges got blocked with these massive, you know, flu bite boulders that are the size of, of excavators. Um, and so what happened is, is that we were able to dynamically model that. Um, the other things that were very promising in this is the, the final results. And I'm going to. Um, all right, sorry. All right, uh, sorry about that. Um, so, um, okay, so how does that translate to, to something that, you know, what, what's the significance? So we talked about non-Newtonian, sorry about the little pause there, I, I was backing out and, um, okay, so uh, what we're seeing here is uh, one of the watersheds, this is San Ysidro watershed, um, it's just, so to the left is where the Montecito uh, model we just showed of the avulsion. We modeled this with 2D RAS. We've also got simulations of this with 2D ADH. On the left, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, the, uh, the Newtonian physics being used. And on the right, we see the non-Newtonian physics. The dark blue line that we're seeing is data collected by Jason Keene and USGS and um, the Cal Geological team. Uh, they looked at uh, depths. They also had some velocity data. Um, but what we really were trying to match is, is you know, we'll look at is the question is, is there a difference? And, you know, can we see that? Well, the, the, obviously, right away, there is a dramatic difference. Keep in mind that the inputs are exactly the same. Um, we're just using the non-Newtonian physics to do this versus the, the non-Newtonian. And so, uh, you know, one thing that's interesting to point on this is this is pretty close to the 100-year floodplain. Um, and so, you know, one of the big things we're trying to stress to, to our partners out west that are challenging and dealing with this, um, you know, most of these fires are going to produce these non-Newtonian uh, events. This appears to be the rule, not the, the exception. Uh, and so, you know, with that, um, you know, we would strongly encourage, you know, to people to look into that. You know, I think the other thing now to point out as we're wrapping up is now it's that it's in RAS. 
And we have the capability to do these in that model uh, framework and then HMS, uh, although we still have to get better uh, and we have to make some improvements, um, you know, this, uh, you know, this is now widely available so that we can really address this, this difference. The other thing that we'll point out here is that, you know, uh, our depths were, were obviously not perfect. Um, some were worse than others. We know why that is. Um, but we are using a very simplistic model framework. Um, a lot of this is associated with some more dynamic processes. We have addressed what those are, and we're actually working to, to correct those right now. Um, kind of the last thing we'll talk about here winding up is another thing we have to consider is, uh, you know, post-wildfire geomorphology and ecology. So geomorphology, I just mean, you know, um, surface processes that, uh, that we look at over, you know, timescales a little outside of engineering timescales. And so, you know, over a 10 year period, um, you know, how is a given uh, regions, how is it recovering? Um, there is a very strong link between the ecology and geomorphology. Uh, there's also a big link between having, uh, you know, a very significant flood event early on uh, that causes instability. And once you uh, cause that instability, uh, that dynamic system, it's harder uh, for vegetation and, and uh, these, these uh, you know, stability ecosystems to, to take hold. And so you can't have this negative feedback. Uh, the other thing is that over time, the properties of the fire, the fire effects actually start to dissipate. Uh, and so what we're looking at here is how the hill slope roughness from a study that was done in 2005, how it uh, evolved over a, you know, a period of time. Uh, and unfortunately, this is this is nonlinear. And so uh, that makes it very challenging and also uh, indicates there are site specific um, processes that are that are governing this. Um, regardless, we do think we're going to be able to use some rules that will allow us to not only run an event, but look at continuous simulations. Um, based on hypothetical rainfall events, you know, staged over, uh, say, a five to 10 year period. Uh, we're still working at that, but uh, kind of our next steps and where we are, and I'll kind of, this is wrapping up here uh, just a few minutes over, but uh, post-wildfire flood risk management uncertainty is really what we're getting at here. You know, our initial applications have been focusing on uh, improving prediction for flood risk. Um, you know, management of risk to infrastructure and military installations is something that um, we started to have a conversation with, with folks with, within uh, our, our USACE chain of command. Um, there are also issues with um, mobility and, and non-Newtonian flow events. Uh, the other things that we're really looking at is, is um, you know, updating our debris basin design and mitigation methods. Now that we can really predict this better, we're going to be able to start to quantify uh, with, with a lot less uncertainty what a given mitigation method, uh, you know, what the outcome of that would be. Um, so we have some, uh, you know, goals over the next few years. We're going to obviously need to gain experience with our districts. This is a very, this is very variable in, in discipline. And it's from biology and ecology all the way to non-Newtonian mechanics. And so uh, it's been very important for us to be working and doing on-the-job training with the district. So we will continue that. Um, the other big thing that we're going to have to do is start to consolidate our knowledge and our expertise. And I don't know if that's necessarily a center of expertise within USACE. Um, but some type of a standardization uh, structure so that, uh, you know, we're, we're all, um, you know, working together without any duplication or overlap. Um, I think that'll be beneficial as we're trying to demo and release these, uh, these models. Uh, so with that, uh, I appreciate everyone's time today. Um, I will switch back so that I can see any questions. Um, and um, I think, uh, thank everyone for, or especially Mike for having me today. All right, so I've got some questions coming in. I'll, I'll start answering those. Um, yes, so uh, there are, uh, so uh, Mark, Dennis asked a question, would you say stick channels to try to control mud flows in high risk areas? Absolutely. Um, the, the idea would be is that there are probably conditions to where you can route, uh, you know, this alluvial fan, you know, the potential uh, out uh, to, uh, you know, maybe a coastal setting or route it around. Uh, and with our models, we can absolutely do that and have a very, uh, you know, very good understanding of what that looks like in the physics. Um, so that is an option. Uh, you know, another thing that's very common is to dig holes, big holes, uh, debris basins and let them infill. Um, uh, another question, this is a, a good question. So uh, from Jeff Lillycrop, um, are we doing 3D modeling? We are in the discussions for that. Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, our priority was to get 
you know, a very simple suite of tools out initially so that in 1D and 2D, so that we could fill this gap because there was a huge need. Um, but I'm working with our lead CFD uh, researcher at, at CHL and our folks um, at IWRHEC to investigate what phenomena are we going to need to do with 3D modeling. The big challenge with that is uh, the, there are flume experiments, but um, there are missing pieces. Uh, and uh, I think we have a little work to do, but that is on our radar. And that'll be also involved with our uh, folks that are doing the um, the higher fidelity discrete element type modeling uh, CFD as well. Uh, let's see if we can get Mike back on here. I know he was having some audio issues. Uh, Mike, can you hear us or is your... So there was another question that I can answer it real quick from Scott Chambers. Uh, so the it's uh, in terms of emergency management, uh, do you have short term emergency tactics that can be used uh, post? Yes. So to to be used to, to you know, mitigate some of the effects, there are a few things, uh, you know, one is contour fellings and any type of mulching in any way to speed up the organic recovery underneath the, you know, the soil. You lose that organic binding uh, benefits. Um, the other thing that we see that is a big problem um, is, is dead trees within the downstream floodplains. Um, a lot of times those trees just become eroded in our missiles and they clog up culverts. And so one thing that we've, we've kind of looked at and, and would uh, actually feel like it would be beneficial is upstream from important, you know, bridges or access roads. Uh, you know, it may be a conversation to, to do we need to clear some of those out and repurpose them assuming that they don't have, uh, you know, um, uh, some, you know, ecological significance. Uh, those are, those are several things. Uh, the other things that people try to do are, are widespread planning. That could be problematic due to, uh, uh, so when you have a burned area, you know, you end up having very hungry animals. And so in a lot of cases, um, you know, they make, with uh, say Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico, they planted uh, 2 million trees. Um, and they were losing uh, hundreds of thousands every month or two to elk. And so they've had to modify how they do that. And um, yeah, so there are, you know, the key things are, you know, get the ground cover going back again, you know, try to have some contour control if you can in your watershed. And then, you know, really start to think about, you know, these projectile risks and are there, you know, trees that, you know, upstream of this infrastructure that can cause issues. We, we're working, uh, Lily Cartwright, uh, is, we're working with entities, research uh, universities, organizations. Um, absolutely. So we're working with, uh, early on in this, we started working with some of the kind of the, the, the na you know, national world leaders. Uh, Pete Robichaud, Lee McDonald, um, uh, and, and uh, Joe Wagenbrenner to really understand, you know, what the science was and how we translate that into our models. Uh, DRI, Desert Research Institute, um, is, is one of our big partners. Uh, we, we also partner with um, uh, University of um, New Mexico and Portland State University. Uh, and then, uh, you know, through all of these things, we always typically, uh, well, we always typically, we typically uh, um, at about, you know, which we've done this, we reach out to, uh, you know, say with non-Newtonian, we reach out to, you know, the, the world experts in that and get their input. Um, and so that's a pretty, pretty standard part of our process. Uh, and then a, a regional component of this is, you know, taking into account those regional uh, experts, you know, knowledge uh, into how the nuances of our modeling uh, approach. Hey, Ian, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, it's Mike. Perfect. Yeah, I think my head, headset went out earlier. Hey, um, really quickly. So one of the questions I had um, and you showed a you showed a graph there at the end, which demonstrated kind of over time. <laughs> Here to show like the effects could be mitigated over time, um, and I think I saw that correctly. So the question is: this, Are you able to model like how, uh, based on the vegetation, et cetera, how the um, effects of of the wildfire diminish over time? So we can maybe predict when we certain put certain mitigation effects, like you talked about before, putting vegetation and et cetera. Can we predict how those things might? improve the performance of the soil over time so so we can mitigate the effects of, of the um, potential flooding yeah that, yeah there you know obviously there's uh, several ways to do that you know there's the very practical straightforward way that you know it's less 
physically robust. Um, but that's so what we do is we, we account for the change in loss of vegetation canopy, the loss of the surface. So you have an increase or decrease in surface roughness. So your overland roughness. Um, and we, um, oh, there's one other process. We, oh, uh, infiltration, that changes as well. So we take the science and the information based on regional data sets from a given fire site. Uh, we, we apply those and, you know, usually put in the most, you know, we, we, we stay within the, the, the limitations of, of, you know, that those modeling assumptions. Um, but right now, I would say for things like, okay, if you need to uh, build a debris basin that has the capacity for 400,000, you know, cubic yards, uh, that's, that's a lot easier than us being able to account how vegetation regrows. Um, in a 2D gridded model, it's easy to, to kind of conceptualize and, and do that. Uh, but in an HMS model, you know, we don't really know. Uh, now, we can make an assumption and say, okay, you have a 20% increase in vegetation, which it reduces, you know, uh, translates to a 40% decrease in, you know, particle um, uh, uh, impact. And uh, there are things like that, but we have more science to do on that. We're, we're not quite there yet. But yes, if you want to say, if we reduce, you know, this amount of runoff uh, or this approximate, you can look at how that condition would change, you know, based on, you know, the, whatever your sensitivity variable is. Excellent. Thanks. I think you have one more question here from Vince. Yes. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we do. Um, we actually had a meeting yesterday with some bar with the barrier leads um, and we are going to be more embedded into the uh, assisting the bear teams as they need it. Um, and the FEMA bulking method, we actually have uh, a few bulking approaches and that's a, uh, um, one of the standard kind of, um, uh, you know, a little more brute force that we use for the hydrology component if we're linking to a hydraulics model. But, but in effect, yes, we, we integrating a lot of that. Um, there are some bare team approaches that are spreadsheets that they have had success with, and we're going to work over the next year to incorporate more of those in there. Um, and then the bulking methods can be invoked either in the HMS um, or in the, the RAS interface. And we have, I think, a couple of bulking approaches that are a function of the concentration and uh, the flood of QS. All right. Any more questions from uh, the audience today? And we can hold here for just a second. Um, so uh, while we see if anybody has any last minute questions, um, I, obviously you threw your um, um, point of contact information up here. So if folks have any additional questions about, you know, how to get hold of these tools, how to use the tools, or, or at least where to find them, um, or any questions about your research, I assume they can they can just contact you directly via email. Absolutely. Give me an email. Yep. And we, we have uh, not only, you know, documents, but we also have, uh, you know, um, uh, YouTube video training and, and several things I can link anyone to. Great. And then uh, uh, there was one more question. Yeah, Lily has one more question here. All right, so uh, these are really good questions. So there are the the Forest Service has uh, some uh, uh, the databases of this. This is something that we are trying. So this is a big um, big objective for me over the next year or two is to standardize. Um, you know, who is how hosting that data? Whether so, if it's a GS, uh, you know. There are some of those. They're not quite as standard. Uh, there are a few different ones. Um, and then for the infiltration and Manning's value, uh, a lot of those are uh, studies that were done. Make sure uh, knowledge. Um, there's a question about excellent results. So the MSDPM, uh, and I always forget what that stands for completely. Uh, it works so well because it was it was it was. Um, designed in that region. So the empirical data that was used to derive that fit to get that model uh, was, was in Southern California. And so it, it very much applies, which is why it, it was so well. The USGS, I should say, which is why, why it was off, is that approach uh, was, is really more suitable for uh, Colorado and, um, and, and uh, New Mexico specifically. And so, you know, that is a very important part of this to look at, you know, where are they developed from? 
you know, what is the range, you know, of our, you know, are we okay with a 0.2 R squared or we want it to be 0.6? Um, so yeah, that, that certainly becomes, a, becomes a, you know, a discussion that we have very early on. And uh, uh, about more information too, we, we also have an email, wildfire at erdic.dren.mil. I think I answered that last question. Did I miss? Let's see. Uh, oh, and the infiltration and Mannings, those are, uh, so the USGS and the Bear teams um, and, and a few different agencies and sometimes with academia. Uh, so we've we really uh, collaborated all of those, uh, st as many studies as we could, and we've uh, digitized a lot of that. And so when we're looking at a model site, we go to that. It's a very simple crude database right now. Um, and we want to fully document it, but what we go to is we see what are the ranges of, you know, what they're using for their infiltration and their, their roughness values. Uh, now, as far as Manning's roughness in our hydraulic equations, um, one of the things in our model that's beneficial is, is you put in that exactly, you don't have to have a modifier on it because we account for all of the, the non-Newtonian stresses. And Ian, before we go, I, I do have one more quick question for you, and then I think we're getting toward the end of our our our, our time here. Um, do you all do um, any outreach with the local communities, um, which you know are kind of in the risk in the risk zones after some of these wildfires? It is, does the uh, Army Corps of Engineers or ERDIC kind of work with local communities to identify some of the risks and help them, kind of at least to see yeah. what potential issues may be. Yeah, so we've really this picked up over the past few years when we, uh, after we demonstrated the Santa Barbara, um, and what we're seeing is, you know, typically they, uh, you know, they coordinate with our district's partner. So if they're in, you know, if this is Ventura County, it's it's LA district. If it's Pima, or if, let's say if it's, you know, Custer County, um, Colorado, it's Albuquerque. Uh, but what we typically do is, um, is we have meetings, assess what their problems are, and then see how we can help. Uh, and then as far as, uh, you know, communicating out to them, uh, we do get involved from time to time with, you know, before the pandemic with, with kind of public meetings. Um, and so we do provide that sometimes. I do think that uh, we have, we're doing, a, we're trying to do a better job of that with communication. Um, so if anyone, you know, has these types of things that come up, um, you know, either go through your district or, or ideally, if you don't know who to reach out to, just email me and I'll get you to the right person. Perfect. Well, thank you, Ian. We really appreciate it. Fantastic um, uh, presentation today. Really foundational work uh, that you all are doing uh, there at Erdic and um, at the Army Corps of Engineers to kind of identify this as an issue. Obviously, with the the fire season that we had last year and and really for several years running now, um, this is you know obviously going to be a big issue for years to come out. Um, certainly out west in the in the areas which experience some of these fires, but really looks like, you know, kind of everywhere that uh, that has that has this kind of fire uh, fire risk and fire potential. So thank you so much. This is this was a great presentation. Very welcome. Um, Tomel, I'm thank gonna, you. I'm going to turn it back over to you and uh, see if I think you have some kind of closing um, comments to make before we before we sign off. Yes. Um, thank you, Ian, again. Thank you, Mike, for moderating. It was definitely a, a, an excellent presentation. Uh, just one final slide. Uh, we are having our 2021 Virtual Capital Week, which is held March 22nd through the 26th. Um, it is a member-only event, but you are able to you know, obtain membership and uh, gain this knowledge from our uh, briefings. You can find out more information on the SAME capweek.org webpage all of the good stuff there will be a virtual exhibit hall and different offerings there as well um, again thank you all for joining this webinar today and uh, you can download the pdf version of the presentation as well as the pdh certificate from the handout section and they will be available to download from the coy webpage at a later date um, enjoy the rest of your day and have a good one Hey, thanks, Tomel. That was great.